we, we, well, let's, let's stand and sing a song called Are You Washing the Blood of the Lamb? Come on. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His graceless heart? Are you washing the blood? we do some standing up and singing some more come on now i know up and down up and down this is a song called your grace is enough one two three four
no clapping. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. church, isn't it? Amen. Ernie, is it okay to have fun in church? Okay, I just want my guy ask Ernie first. <laughs> song called Who You Say I Am. Feeling. 
It's a reason to rejoice. It's a reason to sing praises and just love on you all day today, Lord. And we just pray a special blessing, Lord, on this church, on your pastor, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, will move in here, that he would just step aside and just allow your Holy Spirit to work and to say whatever he wants to say. Lord, we just want you to be praised today. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. see you this morning. I'm seeing some people that I've not seen um, in a long time. And for some of you that are back for the first time, welcome back. Um, you know, uh, there's something about change that uh, none of us like. I don't like change because the older... when Now, when you're younger, you constantly desire change, Right? But when you get older, it's like change sometimes means, oh, goodness, I don't like that kind of change, right? Think about it, you go to the dentist. Nobody likes going to the dentist, do we? And if a change happens at the dentist, the older you get, when that change happens, usually it's something like root canal or for some dentures and whatever, right? <laughs> I mean, we all love Dennis. We love Ivis. Ivis, we love you. As a person, as a child of God. I'm joking. I'm joking. Thanks, Carlos, for reminding me. I'm glad to see you all back there. You all are usually up front. That's the problem. I wouldn't have said those things if you were up front. I would have kept on my P's and Q's. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, whoops. No, it, we, we love them, uh, right? But we know, um, and the older that I get, you know, doctors, dentists, all those things, they're your best friends in the world, right? But sometimes you don't like what they have to do. They don't do that because they get their kicks out of, you know, doing all that work in you, right? But it's for our benefit. But I think to myself, there is a change that t has taken place in the last couple of days here in Baldwin that I'm sort of excited about. I don't know what, if you realize what change I'm talking about, and I'm not talking about the bypass. I covered that last week. That was beautiful, by the way. How many? I've been like on the bypass like five times last week for no reason at all other than to just drive on it. Like, I'm joking. You know, not that much. But <laughs> I'm not that sorry of an individual. I've got to find something else to do, like, you know, drive on Baldwin in our golf cart that we uh, don't have. But we have our little tiny golf. Anyway, I've covered that out as well. Here's the change I'm talking about. You ready for this? It's in the air. You feel it? A breeze. The other night we were at the Baldwin football game. Baldwin won. <clears throat> they held on to their lead at the like the last 45 seconds, right? It was an exciting game. Chrissy's from West Nassau, so uh, of course 
she was try- we were trying to cheer for Baldwin, but her father and because uh, uh, Nolan was playing, our nephew was playing for West Nassau. So I told him, I said, y'all are sitting on the Baldwin side, and they didn't stop. They cheered for West Nassau and almost got into a fight. But uh, that's another story for another day. <laughs> but the other night we were at the football game, and boy. Crisp, cool air for the first time in how long, right? That's hard. Is it exciting? How many of y'all like fall, right? It's an exciting time, right? Change of seasons. And as the video says, you know, we have a God who never changes, one who we can count on. And uh, I think we talked about this the other night. I am thankful that we serve a God who's holy. If God wasn't holy... We'd all be in a heap of trouble, wouldn't we? We ought not be threatened by that. We ought to be welcoming and thankful for the fact that He is holy God and that we as God's people, as children of God, as we sang, have the privilege and the honor of entering into His presence. And I hope and pray for you this morning. Don't take for granted what we're doing here. Welcome to those that are joining us online. I've already seen your comments. I've already seen you join us, and I'm thankful that you're with us this morning. I pray that God has a special message to speak to each of us as we think about this subject this morning, the heartbeat of the mission, the heartbeat of the mission. In Acts chapter 13, uh, we're going to be looking at verse 1 through 13. Let's stand together to give honor and reverence the reading of God's Word. Are you looking for that new that God is doing in your life? You see, here's the, the reality of it. God wants to change you in a good way that we will adjust to him and to his mission. It says in verse number one, Now, in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who's called the Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus when they arrived at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant, and we know which John this is, John Mark. And uh, we're going to find out about him down the road here. Um, now, when they had gone through uh, the island uh, to Paphos, Paphos they f- uh, found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who's also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is called upon you, for you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went away, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John, or John Mark, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. We love you, Lord, and I uh, pray that you just give us a sense of the heartbeat of the mission that you've called us to. Father, um, as we seek those new things in our lives and seek the, the changes that you're doing, and just as the change of seasons come so quickly, will come the moment to be led by you. And I pray all of us will adjust to you this morning. We'll hear from you and obey. If there's a soul here that's never been saved, that today would be the day of their salvation. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you. Thank you for your grace. 
And thank you for the gift of God, eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And I'll pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 simply says this, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. And then it says this, Do all things, can you all follow this, without complaining and disputing. Amen? How many of you all have fallen short on that one this week? How many of you all have fallen short on that one this morning? No, don't tell me. I don't want to know. I'm not looking up. In verse number 15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Do you know that it is God who works in you? If you're a child of God this morning, say amen. amen. Hey, that song should have just been right there, overflowing out of your heart and praise and worship to Him. I said something the other day in our online Bible study, um, and if you haven't had a chance, check it out. We're going through the book of Ruth right now, Chrissy and I sort of have some conversations on Friday morning. Thank you for tuning in uh, for that. But uh, boy, it's been a great time. Well, one of the things that, uh, that we talked about is, is the very fact that I am thankful that as God is working in us, that I have the opportunity to join him and adjust to him and allow him to do that work. But here's the key. Our worship that we, and our thankfulness that we have in our lives is not based upon the externals, but is that work that God is doing inside of us. Makes you know that you're alive. Even at 9.24 in the morning, you're alive. And you're happy because you know we've got to cut the service off at 10 a.m. this morning. <laughs> Thanks for the extra time this morning, David, by the way. Our worship. How was it this, how was it this morning? I'm not asking about, I don't want you to, you know, get. Were you singing from the overflow of your heart? Or somebody having to commit you. Now, I understand. When you get up early in the morning, and a lot of us, some of us, how many of y'all are highly motivated in the morning times? Raise your hand. Right? How many of you, that's exactly the opposite of who you are, right? You know you're a child of God, but you're not motivated in the morning, right? Don't talk to me before 10 o'clock, right? But every time that we have an opportunity to gather together, we are the children of God. And here's the great part about that. When we talk about worship and thankful from the overflow in our heart, I am thankful that it is God is the one that is working in us. Now, why? Both to will and to do for His good pleasure. And, you know, as I think about that phrase that I brought up a second ago, do all things without complaining, disputing, murmuring, all of those things, right? How many of us take pleasure in knowing that we have the opportunity as the body of Christ to just simply love Him and love the world to Jesus? Now, we don't love the world system. We love the world, though. We want to share the gospel with them, a place that's in darkness to share the light. That God has called us for a mission. That heartbeat of the mission is simply the gospel of Christ. That's never changed. That's the heartbeat of our mission here. You think about why we do what we do. You think about why we're already tackling Awanas, by the way. September the 30th, woo-hoo, ready to go, right? We had a great meeting this past Wednesday night with all of our Awanas teachers and workers, and boy, we're super excited for that, right? In case you're joining us online, September the 30th, we're beginning uh, on Wednesday evening. Uh, we're going to be offering our Awanas 
Also, uh, that is going to be the evening that we're going to open up our preschool, limited preschool, birth through three. And from then on, uh, the next, the following Sunday, um, uh, the preschool will be open up. Shine students, that is going to be significant because that's the first night they've been meeting over here in the Family Life Center. That'll be the first night they'll be back up in the youth wing. And of course, we're always taking precautions. We're always doing what we can to keep things safe and uh, uh, have respect for one another. But at the same time, um, there comes a time where we as a church, it's ready. It's time to move. It's go time. And um, uh, we feel like it's go time. It's time for us. We've got to be imparting the Word of God. We've got to be coming alongside young, our young families and, show, and, and assisting them as they are uh, raising their children in the ways of the Lord and in the Word of God. You think about how we do what we do, and, and everything that we do, we don't do with complaining. Why? That we may become blameless and harmless Children with, uh, of God without fault in the midst. Now, this is the thing, and I'm going to go back to the original text in just a moment. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Hey, do we, can we identify with that? Do we know what that's about? So what is our purpose among all of those things? To shine as lights in the world. You're called to shine. Hey, Good term right there, right, Jason? And as we're shining, we're, we're doing what? We're holding fast the word of life. And then the Apostle Paul, to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. I am so thankful this morning for the heartbeat of our mission and realizing that everything that we do is not in vain, and we do it for the Lord as an unto, and, and unto the Lord. Well, we find in this text in Acts chapter 13, the beginning, um, if you will. Now, we've already seen in, in Acts chapter 11, um, Paul and Barnabas, as they uh, went out to bring relief uh, to the brethren uh, that were dwelling in Judea. They had already been at work, but this we will mark and note as, if you will, the beginnings of that first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas, and for a very short period of time, John Mark. And uh, I'm going to reserve comments on John Mark and everything else for another day, but suffice it to say, uh, it's a significant thing in verse number 13 when Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Uh, and we're going to find out it was so much of a problem that it, it became so much of a divide between Paul and Barnabas that they split ways as well. And we'll talk about that for another day. But we think about the heartbeat of our mission. Why do we exist as a church? Why do we, are we still doing this thing when everybody says the church is dead, don't even bother, COVID's destroyed it, don't even bother going back to church, they don't want you there anyway. The heartbeat of our mission, the church is the church because we are called out ones, right? In fact, let me just say this to you. This is my first point for you. And when we look at this passage of Scripture, it's interesting in this verse number one, these five that have been called, right? There are certain prophets and teachers, and they were named by name. We need to realize this, and I'm going to give this to you, and, and this is not anything earth-shattering to you, but we have to realize these things, that we are the body of Christ. You sang a song earlier, I'm a child of God, yes I am, right? That ought to be exciting to you, to know that you're a child of God, that you're part of the body of Christ, that God has called you to something bigger than yourself. Just to go beyond yourself and to realize that you have a mission. We have a mission because we are the body of Christ. Now, the Bible tells us, uh, you know, of course, that the list begins with Barnabas. And we've already seen Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Barnabas is called, uh, and, and the book of Acts chapter 11 and verse uh, 24, he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. 
Back in chapter 4 of the book of Acts, we find that Barnabas sold all that he had and gave to those that were in need. In chapter 9, Barnabas interceded on behalf of uh, Saul, who would be Paul, and testified, came alongside Paul and testified to his conversion. And then we find Simeon, the Bible says, who is called Niger. And probably uh, we know uh, from Africa, and some speculate this could have been Simon of Cyrene who carried the cross for Christ. There's no way to know for sure, but just use your imagination for a moment. There's not much more that we have here. Lucius from Cyrene, North Africa, modern Libya, a Gentile from Northern Africa and uh, as some have speculated, could have been one of the men who br first brought the gospel um, to Antioch. Manian, named comforter or consoler, and we're told that he was brought up. Now, think about this for a moment. This is, if this is your, out of your resume, you grew up with Herod the Tetrarch, the the literal Greek word for brought up means to be nursed together. And the idea, they had uh, been together, him and, and Herod, um, and grown up in the house of Herod the Great, the man who murdered John the Baptist. And then we find Paul, as the Bible says here, Saul, and it just says, and Saul. Of course, we know Paul, Saul, the former persecutor of Christians, Hebrew of the Hebrews, well-educated ed Jew, listed as a teacher here. Five different men from different walks of life. And here's my point here, but all with the hand of God on their lives. Now, I wonder if for a moment there would be a record in here. And your name was called out. Might it say something like this, Bart the Aggravator. I do. And that's as far as I'm going to go. I don't want to offend anybody else. It's okay that I offend Bart. So, uh, no, call it your name. I'm joking with you, with you Bart, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I know. Uh, I should have, but <laughs> wait a second. I've already raked on Ivis and Bart. I don't know who's next. So, uh, will you all forgive me, please? Uh, we're good. Now, look, you, can I just say this to you? You may feel like you have no purpose. You don't have anything to offer. Do you realize he's placed you in the body of Christ for a reason? And I'm going to tell you, um, and I make reference probably pretty much every service with COVID and everything that's been going on. You can't just shut off what's happened in the last night. Can you imagine this for a moment? Last seven months? And if we're not careful, people throughout those seven months have been isolated. And there may be somebody in here and some, or somebody online, and for whatever reason, everything has just thrown you off to the point that you've forgotten your purpose. But before we talk about purpose, you've forgotten your place. You're part of the family of God if you're a child of God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful to be a part of family? Isn't there a great benefit to being a part of family? We love each other here, don't we? For the most part. Bart loved me until I made that comment, and he's like angry. He's fuming over there. Why do I pick on you right now? Can you just sit up front next time you... you and Carlos and I, no, I just joking. please don't. It'll distract me. <laughs> Yo, 
God has placed us. And let's not just be, you know, abstract here. Let's be practical. He has placed you in this body. Not just the body of Christ. We're all in the overall body of Christ. But he has placed you. Now let's talk about the context of where we are. First Baptist Church of Baldwin. He's placed you here. Now, has he placed you here for no reason? Or has, you pla- has he placed you here for his pleasure? What did we share earlier? Now, let me give you a passage of Scripture here. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verse number 11, says this. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. And I'm going to even say this. I know this. We, you know, we have had people that are placed in the Word of God to teach and to preach the Word of God, and thankfully for that. That is the primary reason we exist as we are together. But it's interesting. It says this, verse number 12 of Ephesians 4, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Equipping, edifying, building up, equipped in the truth. Now, um, you know, we've been talking in uh, our Wednesday evening Bible studies out of the book of Colossians, and now in our Sunday evening, tonight at 6 p.m., out of the book of 1 John, it is important for us to understand, you talk about unity, you talk about being encouraged in your faith, we're encouraged in the faith when we know truth, and that truth provokes us as a church, to be unified, to love one another, and and to go to our world with the gospel. But we need to know what God's truth is. And His truth, as we're equipped for the work of ministry, that equipping with the truth of the Word of God will always bring us assurance and confidence. And will always build up, not tear down. And then it says this, till we all come, in verse 13 of that same chapter of Ephesians 4, to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness, there's that word again from our study on Wednesday nights, the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And again, let's go back, truth. God's absolute truth by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. To get back to Acts chapter 13 and verse 1 for a moment, it says, now in the church that was at Antioch, by the way, great testimony, the church at Antioch. What did we talk about last week? Very corrupt, sexually immoral, but through that we find this group of believers that were called Christians first in Antioch. But let's think about this for a moment, that word church. Ecclesia literally means this, and this is where I want you to see with the body of Christ for a moment. Ecclesia, a called out assembly. By the very definition of church, It requires that church be both. Ready? Called out and assembly. If you're saved, you're children of God, you're part of the family of God, and we are to be assembled and we are called out. Um, 
I think it's important for us as we look at this passage of Scripture, especially in the book of Acts, that we know that the book of Acts gives us indication of the local church, the visible body of baptized believers that were called out to a world, but they were assembled as well for the worship of God, for the exhortation or the encouragement, the edifying of one another, and the carrying out of the Great Commission. It's not just saying, well, the church, the church is called out and we're to go, and it doesn't make a difference what happens here. Or the other end, the church is to be assembled, but it doesn't make a difference what we do as long as we're assembling, right? But it has to be both. We assemble together. We join together. Why? is the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ assembled together to worship, to learn, to build each other up to encourage one another, to exhort one another, so that when we do go out, that we, as we are the church scattered, that we leave to go on mission, to carry the great commission to a world who so desperately needs it. That is your mission. That is my mission. It isn't just coming so we can make sure we're sitting in the chairs. We used to say pews, chairs, And I'm so glad when you're here, but I will say this, if we make just coming here the only thing, we miss the whole point of everything. But if we say, I'm alone, and I can do it on my own, and I'm called out, so I'm going to be out there somewhere, and I'm just going to do it, you've also missed the point. Called out once. The called out assembly. And that's what makes it so exciting, right? Book of Psalms chapter 122 verse 1 says this, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Uh, That word glad, by the way, in that verse uh, literally means to brighten up, to cheer up, to be joyful. And what I love about gathering together, we have an opportunity to encourage one another, to cheer each other up. There's something about it. When I come in here, do you realize, and you know, a couple of weeks ago, I know in our all-ins Bible study, I joke about it, but there are moments in my life that I am cranky. A cranky old man, Chrissy calls me now. You believe, how many of y'all believe that I can be cranky? Put that hand down, Hudson. What are you doing? You're raising your hand, buddy boy. What's that? I wasn't paying attention to her. She's irrelevant for the moment, so I'm joking with you, Hudson. I'm glad you, I'm glad you rose your hand, because I can be grouchy, cranky. Now, let me just ask you, how many of y'all can be cranky and grouchy? Before you start throwing stones, let's get honest here. There are sometimes, you balance honest with you, human emotions that we experience. Have you ever just been going to church? I don't, I don't raise your hand on this. And you just really didn't feel like going to church. <gasps> really? Every one of us should feel like going to church. Shame on you. You know, there are moments, if it truth be known, I would love to stay home and sleep in on Sunday mornings. Maybe I'm tired. Now, that only happens for a moment. Now, if you're watching online, it's like, see, that's why I don't go to church, because I know even if the preacher struggles with that. (laughs) We have very human emotions, but you know, sometimes I'm not feeling my best, and maybe sometimes I might just not be in a good mood. But you know what's great? And this is what the benefit of being that part of the assembly That when I come in here and I see your smiling faces and we worship together, there's something about it that we need. And I've used this illustration before. You've probably heard this illustration before, and it's so true. Those of you that have charcoal grills, right? When you're trying to get that charcoal lit and that grill, what do you do? Do you place the charcoal in the ends of either? of the thing and keep them separated? Is that the way the charcoal burns best? What do you do? 
put them in a heap. Now, I'm not saying we'll put them in a pile here, right? But whatever. Because we can't do that right now. Social distancing, right? And that's a part of the problem with that physical distancing that we have is sometimes we lose track of that encouragement. But all I know is this. It builds fire, the right kind of fire in us. Passion. You ever had that moment where you were just down and you lost sense of your place and your purpose in God's church? And all it took was just one person that came up to you. Now, I've seen the opposite happen, by the way. With your tongue, you can tear somebody down. Be careful of that. Be careful of what we say. Guard your tongue. Because never in a million years had God ever intended on the church being the place where somebody is torn down because of somebody's careless speech. That was a freebie. But the body of Christ to build up. To edify one another. To encourage one another. I hope and pray maybe you've been encouraged in some way since you've been here this morning. You know what encourages me when I look around? And sometimes I just have a way. I just had to look back this morning. Sometimes I just want to see what's going up on the back screen. But sometimes it's because I want to see worship. And it's not saying that you're dependent upon my worship, but I just it encourages me when I see God's church affected by the presence of God. So take it as it is. There's a benefit to the body of Christ. And I'm thankful for the place that God has given to us as his church. Now, secondly, we are the body of Christ. That's where it begins with the heartbeat of our mission, right? But second, you ready for this? <clears throat> we have been called to serve. We've been called to serve. Now, what did the Bible say? In verse number two, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. We've been called to serve. Um, the Bible tells us uh, in the book of Galatians, chapter six, and verse number nine, um, <clears throat> it simply says this. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Let me just put something in here for us today. Let's not grow weary in serving. It's interesting, you, you see, uh, you know, this activity that they had, they ministered to the Lord. Do you know what that word literally means? To serve publicly. To serve publicly. They were a part of the body of Christ, but yet they knew that their calling was to serve. Not to get, not try to soak it in from somebody else, but to serve. Do you have that sense? You find your place? Then you find your purpose, and that's what we've been talking about, place and purpose. Called to serve. The place where they served, of course, was in the church and through the church. Can I just say this to you, and I think this is a, so very important for us to understand. For anybody that's sort of a Lone Ranger Christian, you know what I'm talking about when I say Lone Ranger? I had a thought, and I'm not doing that thought because it was an irrelevant story for the moment. I'll come back to that maybe another time. Some of y'all saw that, like, look on my face like I had a smile. I was about to share with you a funny story. It's, it's, not, it's not time. But here's the thing. If you believe that you're a lone ranger Christian, I'll share it with you just in case you're wondering. I had a couple of times where I had some premarital counseling this week, and I asked two separate couples if they knew who Mr. Magoo was. Y'all know how many of y'all know who that is, right? And they looked at me like I have no clue. 
It let me know how old I was. Thanks. That was the irrelevant thought. I just just throwing it out. When I said Lone Ranger, how many of y'all know what I mean by Lone Ranger, right? If I were to say the Brady Bunch, how many of y'all know the Brady Bunch, right? Gilligan's Island, right? Irrelevant to anything. So just don't quit raising your hand and encouraging me. Here's the thing. We have too many people that think that they can do it on their own, and we are called to serve in the church and through the church. Whether it's here as the assembled ones or out there as the called out ones. It's important for you to have an understanding of that. I think sometimes people sit around and wonder, why is God not expanding my influence? Why is not giving me a ministry? Let me ask you, maybe it's because you've not been faithful where you are. That sort of hurt. Here's a good principle for you. You serve where God has you to serve. Don't quit looking down the uh, quit looking down the road. Don't keep saying somewhere down there God has a place for me to serve. I'm going to find it one day. Do what God has already revealed to you. Serve. The problem isn't the fact that God hasn't spoken. The problem is that sometimes we just plain don't want to be bothered. We're comfortable where we are. Sometimes God's people are idle while the world's going to hell. Now that got serious real quick, didn't it? Do you realize that, if you didn't realize this, that we've been given as a church the Great Commission? Hmm. We have to quit being idle. I was talking earlier. I think, and I pray for our church and for others as well, that this is a wake-up time for us. Quit soaking in yourself. I've said this at one of the Bible studies. They all run together for me, but I'm just going to bring it out to you again. You know what will make for a, a bitter old man? when I do nothing but serve myself. If you make your life about trying to get more enjoyment for yourself and serving yourself, you will end up, you may not be there today, you will end up bitter because you've been selfish. The true secret is finding that selfless place of service I was thinking about some categories of some people in their service. Some have retired from service. I'm looking forward one day to retirement when I'm 93 years old. I don't want to retire, to be honest with you. I heard Charles Stanley retired this, not retired. He passed the torch along, but he said, I'm going to continue to preach the word as long as God has given me breath. And I think that's sort of what was said. Did you, did you read that to me or did I dream that? Okay. Sometimes I got to ask her. Sometimes I dream things. And it's like, I wonder if that. Anyway, do you realize that we never have a moment to retire? Some of you retired. Isn't it a glorious thing? You thought it was a glorious thing until you realized that you're still just as busy, even fact busier than what you were when you were working. Right? And then you wonder how many of you ever want, that are retired? you wonder, how did I get everything done while I was working? Did is anybody like that? How did I get it all done? How about this? There are some that have just relaxed. You know there's something about relaxing. I've talked about my lazy boy, right? I sit in that thing, and it doesn't take but two seconds. What was it the other night? You said, uh, did you enjoy that show? I said, yeah. I said, you sure did. You were snoring the whole time. Some of us have relaxed. Um, and sometimes we're just weary. And this is where we go back to that. Let's not go, grow weary and, you know, let's not grow weary while doing good. Some have sort of uh, gotten their priorities mixed up and they've redirected their lives somewhere else. Huh. What is that? 
We found something better to do. You know, that's why sometimes sign-up sheets don't work. And I've found that through the years. We have a sign-up sheet here at the church. Sign up for it. we got some banquet or we've got this going on. And why don't people sign up right at first? And it's because, I mean, if you're like me, you forget. But sometimes you don't sign up because you're waiting. If something better comes along, you don't want to commit. Is that right? And that's not just church. That's anything else. You just I'm not going to sign on the dotted line. I'm not going to sign up for that until I find out, is there something better that's going to come along? When I was growing up, that was that way. I was always looking for something better. I was never satisfied with where I was. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4 talks about those that are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Some of us, your allegiances have been redirected to the things of this world. Are you lovers of pleasure more than you are lovers of God? 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10 tells us about Demas. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Don't grow weary in doing good. They knew that they had a place to serve. They knew that they had the presence of Jesus going with them wherever. He's, he's promised them. He said, I'm going to be with you always. I'm going to give you power. They've been called to serve. They knew that their most important work was the preaching of the word. They've been called to serve. They knew that the, the, what enabled them to do what they did was the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says they ministered to the Lord and they fasted. What were they doing? They weren't just fasting because they were dieting. You know what I'm saying? They were fasting and praying. They were seeking the Lord. Passionate before the Lord. Now, we as Baptists, we don't know much about fasting. Because when we fast, we want to do it really fast. I fasted between breakfast and lunch. That's all I need. Right? There's something about seeking the Lord. And, um, you know, uh, I want to encourage you. I've been challenged by Franklin Graham this Saturday. We're not going to have an official moment Saturday, but I encourage you this Saturday as believers in Christ to join together to pray for our upcoming election. In fact, this week, uh, Landon doesn't know this yet, but we're going to be posting something to you, some ways that you can pray for the election. But now more than ever, God's people need to be seeking the Lord. And we need to be seeking the Lord for this. We need to be seeking the Lord for our nation. We need to be seeking, seeking the Lord for everything that's going on around us right now. Now, it's important. We're to be a light. But are we just to throw up our hands and say, okay, whatever comes... Are we to be people that are passionate and seeking him and saying, God, have your way? And I think it's important. And that's going to kick off our time for the next month in the month of October to be praying. I've told you before, and I believe this to be true, that from this pulpit, I am not to be political, touting one party over the other. But as a pastor and as a preacher, I'm going to be upholding this word and do what I can to point to the issues of what we struggle with as a society. And when it's wrong, it's wrong. Right? But we as God's people need to be seeking him. I hope you've been praying, but if you get a chance this Saturday, sometime this Saturday, we'll put some things online that can help you with that. But sometime this Saturday, you take a moment and you say, God, I'm seeking you for these things. Now, this church, they sought the Lord for what reason? They said, look, they were seeking the Lord. Where, where do we go? What do you want us to do? And, I, and it doesn't say it, but th this is the heartbeat, right? The heartbeat of our mission, before we even go, we're seeking the Lord. And when we seek the Lord, this is a great thing. And we spend time with him and we're passionate about seeking him. Guess what? He speaks. And the Bible says, as they ministered unto the Lord and they fasted, they were serving, they had been called to serve. The Bible said that the Holy Spirit spoke. Isn't that a great thing when we know that God's Holy Spirit is moving and speaking? By the way, through His Word. You know uh, what's great? 
is when you seek, you take time to seek him in his word, God's Holy Spirit, as a believer in Christ, who's indwelling you, is called to be our teacher. He convicts, he teaches, he reveals. And if there's that moment, it's like, wow, I never saw that before. Or, wow, this is so great. This is so powerful. That's God's Holy Spirit working in you and speaking to you in accordance with God's word. And what was the message here? Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them to. Having fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. And this be getting, if you would, that first missionary journey. And we're going to cover that in, in the days to come. But you talk about the body of Christ. You know, do we really take time for prayer? And let me just challenge you with this. And I'm, I've got to be done. It's 10 or 2. But here's the thing. This past Sunday night was such an incredible, moving experience for me. And we've been meeting. I've been here all along. Even during COVID, right, David? We've been, we've been in here, even without people in here, and just a camera, and just us. But I'm going to tell you, it was just, can I say it this way? It was plum exciting last Sunday night. 6 p.m., the altars were opened. It was a holy ground moment for me, and I know for many. But one of the things that we are placing as a priority on our Sunday nights isn't just the teaching of the Word, which will be out of 1 John, but also God's people seeking Him in prayer. We're going to do that tonight. I invite you back, 6 p.m. One day soon, we're probably going to be saying 5 p.m. for choir and then 6 p.m. for church. Watch it. It's coming. We're the body of Christ. We've been called to serve. Number three. I'm going to have to draw it to a close. We are to go to all the world. Now, I'm not going to get a chance to talk about everything that happened. Uh, you know, a man was seeking of the, uh, of the Lord, and there was a sorcerer who was keeping him, trying to keep that from happening. And Paul called it out, and Sergius Paulus came. And the Bible says in verse number 12, the pro council believed when he saw what had been done. Um, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now, what, what, what was the proconsul, is the belief provoked from? Not because of this thing that took place, but because of the teaching of the Lord. But here's the thing, and I, I don't want to get too much into that because I'm really out of time, but here's the thing. The Bible says, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them to. They fasted and prayed. They had laid their hands on them. They sent them away. And being sent by the Holy Spirit, they went down. And they were preaching the word. They were facing danger. They were facing things. And I'm going to tell you this. If you look at this, this sort of gives an indication of just the messiness of ministry sometimes. You think, I'm called to go, and God's going to just open up the way, and there's not going to be any conflicts, any problems whatsoever. And it's exactly the opposite. You're going to face problems. You're going to face conflicts. You're going to face stuff. And it's not going to be easy. But God promises he'll lead us every step of the way if we'll follow him. Our job is to make ourselves available. Um, if, you'd, have you, if you've missed Monday school, you need to join in next tomorrow night, right? Monday school is great. This past, this past Monday, you can go back online. You can find it on our Facebook page or you can find it on fecbowman.com. Click the watch tab on that, but boy, it, that Isaiah chapter 6, and boy, Ernie and Carol, you did a fantastic job on that. But one of the keys for me after Isaiah, you know, has that interaction and with the holiness of God and the woe is me for I'm undone and all of these things and the seraphim flew and a live coal had been taken from the tongs of the altar, touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. The natural thing after our sin is forgiven, our sin is purged, our sin is taken care of. The Bible says in verse number 8, Isaiah chapter 6, Then I heard a voice saying to the Lord, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. We are sent out. We are to go to all the world. And our job is to be available for God to do with us what He pleases for his will. 
Y'all, we've been given a message. We have the heartbeat of our mission is the fact that we have been called to go to the world with a message of hope. And here's the message. Jesus died for our sins. And he rose again. And our job is to preach that gospel message, to give hope to a world, to challenge them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. To see ch true change come to somebody's life, not just reformation of behavior, but a true heart change. Does that happen with you? You know, we talk about the hope of the world. We talk about being a part of the body of Christ. How do you be a part of the body of Christ? How are you a part of the body of Christ? You have to be saved. You have to be, become a child of God. And it's not a work. The work has already been done. Jesus died on the cross. The one who was sinless became sin for you that you might become the righteousness of God. And he has given you the opportunity to accept, to receive his gift. The gift of God that is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And for you this morning, maybe that's what your decision need to be. needs to be that you need to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. If you're a child of God this morning, that's a great thing. And praise the Lord for it. Now, here's the thing. Realize you're part of the body of Christ. Realize that you are called to serve. And you need to realize that we've been called to go to the world. But maybe it has to start with the fact that maybe I've never received your gift, Lord. So I'm going to ask you if you would to stand. And there's never been a point in your life where you've been saved, and I know you know who it is that I'm talking to. I don't have to convince you of this. You know right now if that's you or not, if you're a child of God, if you've been saved. And if you haven't, you know what you need to do right now. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to lead you in an opportunity to be able to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved right here, right now, for your life to be totally changed forever by calling on his name. And if that's you this morning, you'd like to be saved, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray with me. I'm going to assist you in our prayers, not words, but it's a presentation of your heart. Would you pray with me right now if you've never been saved? Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And Lord, because of those sins, I'm broken and I'm separated from you. And Lord, I sure need you today because I've tried everything else and nothing is satisfied but nothing has brought you to me to you more than right now, knowing that Jesus died for my sins and rose again. So today, I turn for my sins, and I'm asking you, Lord, save me. I believe that Jesus died and rose again. I confess it with my mouth. I believe it in my heart. Jesus is Lord. And today I give my life to you. Thank you for forgiving me and saving me of my sins. I want to follow you. Thank you for faith in you and the gift of God. I love you, Lord. If you prayed something like that this morning, or maybe just a simple calling on him. Simple. A childlike faith. If that's you this morning. You've prayed and received salvation. If you're in the sanctuary, in a moment we're going to be singing a hymn. Maybe that's your time to come forward and just claim your personal touch that God has done in your life. If you're online this morning, you can call 904-266-4222. Somebody's on the other end to, to talk to you and to pray with you and to show you the next steps of believers' baptism and growing in the Lord. Maybe you need to join, uh, to get online at fbcbowen.com and click the My Decision tab and just let us know what decision you made, whether you've been saved, whether you rededicated your life, or whether it's a special prayer request, or you need to be baptized. Whatever it is, would you be willing to allow God to lead? Maybe in the comment section below online, you just need to put on there, I've gotten saved, or I've rededicated my life, I've made a decision to follow him, whatever it is. 
Can we make this our testimony? God has moved. God has touched. God has sent Jesus. What a wonderful gift he is. Lord, we love you. Be with this time of your invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing the song, He Touched Me. This is your personal testimony this morning. This is our time to proclaim, church. Shackled by a heavy burden. What decision do you need to make for the Lord? Don't turn him away, but be obedient to his word. The hand of Jesus touched me. Come on, church, let's make this our proclamation. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. Praise his name. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know. Bless you. Let's go change the world for Jesus. Amen.
this good afternoon we've been up since early ain't that right how how's dragging y'all he's he got he got a wasp bit his finger and it's his playing finger that's the bad thing it's it's it's, it's not the good finger you know what i'm saying <laughs> but would you stand with us we're gonna start the service with are you washed in the blood service started out right amen Woo. we got a cheer cheer for jesus and all of that i'm so thankful that you are here this morning um doesn't get any better than asking that question you're washed in the blood of the lamb but if you're from baldwin are you washed in the blood of the lamb right isn't that right scrub, scrub yeah Yes. Did, did, now let me ask you this, David, because this is a very important question. Come up to the mic. I want to, because I got to get your honest okay. answer. Your first, you know, observation. And when I said washed, mm -hmm. I actually said washed. washed. Did you notice the difference? Uh, well, it's it's, it's, you know, it's the Yankee stuff that is still rubbing. <laughs> it's still it's still a little yeah, still a little Yankee. -ish. Still Yankee a little. Yankee. Did you notice a difference, Hal? <laughs> Okay, okay, even with the wasp bite. So, pray for Hal's wasp bite um, today. That's a big, is that, you really did get bit by a wasp, oh? Can I see that? Oh, wow. Ooh. You don't need to go to the hospital, do you? Are you good? Was that yesterday? When, that, when did that happen? Bad day. Good, yeah. No, we need him to play. I don't, you know, what are those things? Hey, welcome to you this morning. I'm so thankful that you're here. I'm doing a little cutting up, and I shouldn't be, but uh, 
the joy of the Lord, right? I'm glad to see a smile on your face. Uh, and um, I hope and pray if one thing that you gain when you, before you leave out of this place is that you'll know that we've had the presence of Jesus in this place this morning. And that's enough to change all of us. And I pray that uh, we don't, when we walk out the back doors of the church or whichever door we do walk out this morning, when we get done with the worship service, that in some way we'll be different. That's my prayer for you today. So as we do that, I, I just want to, to welcome you and let you know how excited and how glad I am that you're here. We've already had one great worship service, and I know I look forward to the sweet spirit that what God is doing in this place this morning. So would you join me, with me in prayer? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that you are here. And all joking aside, Lord, it is an awesome thing to know that we can come boldly before the throne of grace, that we can enter in and worship you. And I pray this morning that you would overflow us with gratitude, that you've saved us to the uttermost, and to the core we have been changed. Receive our worship today, Lord. We praise your holy name. Help us to know that you're here in this place. And I'll pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to do a song that we, we this is the first time we've done as a band. And, and uh, well, I think you know it, though. It's called Your Grace is Enough. Would you stand with us? One, two, three, four. <laughs>
We're going to blame it on the finger. Yeah. <laughs> it was actually my finger. Next song is a song that uh, it's really just an anthem for us who are who are born again. It's, it's, it's awesome to say that that we are a child of God. Amen. You know, isn't it awesome to know that you're a child of God? It's just, I mean, some people believe just being born that they're a child of God. But you're not truly a child of God unless you've been born again. So this song is about those who've been born again. Who am I? singing y'all let's pray real quick dear heavenly father lord we thank you for this time that you've given us lord that we can come into your house and we can sing praises to you lord knowing that you deserve all the praise that we can give you we pray lord a special blessing upon our pastor as he brings a message we pray lord for lost souls to be saved and for those who are saved to just get a little bit closer today we ask all this in jesus name amen you can be seated
Well, hasn't it been sweet already to be in the presence of God? I'm thankful that uh, we have a faithful God who never changes, but yet a God who is always doing something new in our lives. And the change that takes place is a change in us. I hope and pray for you this morning, whether you're here and whether you're online, that you'll see who God is, that He is worthy of worship, and our calling is to adjust our lives to Him. Something new. I'm thankful that... uh, All the failures of yesterday, um, I can put those in the past. I can learn from them. Don't go that road again. You ever had a thing where you just kept doing the same thing over and over and over again, and it's like, okay, I should have learned the first time, not the good thing to do, right? But I'm thankful that God gives us that fresh touch. His mercies that are new every day. Um, By the way, we're in Acts chapter 13 this morning thinking about the subject, the heartbeat of the mission. Um, If you haven't already taken your Bibles and turned them over there, Acts chapter 13, uh, some exciting stuff we see in the early church. But I'm thankful that, uh, you know, as that video has already sort of shown us, there are different seasons, different times, and it sort of brings excitement. And I said to the earlier service this morning, I said, you know, there's an excitement for me right now of a change that has taken place here in Baldwin in the last couple of days. Anybody guess what that change is? Cool weather. What's that? Oh, the bypass. Yes, bypass. I brought that up this morning, too, is that I've already been to bypass several times, and there's no reason for me to go on it just to say, hey, I'm going over the bypass. Hasn't changed. Today, I might just take a trip over to the bypass, right? That's what we do in Bob when we just drive. Now we drive on the bypass instead of wait on the trains. But then there are people that are still waiting on the trains. On yellow water, yes. I'm sorry. We'll pray for you. Go the long way around. Go up 301, come that way, and then you won't have to worry about the bypass. That, may, that would mean that you'd have to go all the way down Yellow Water, all the way over, all the way up. So we'd have to get 30 to 45 minutes earlier. 30 to 45 minutes earlier, yes. Pam, uh, <laughs> if you drive faster than 10 miles an hour, you might get there faster. Just tell you. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, you know, uh, it is... Went to the football game, Baldwin football game. Baldwin won the other night. Woohoo! Yes, uh, the band won the other night. Yes, woohoo! Get a great job, Luke, over there. Great job. Um, actually, Baldwin, if you didn't know this, Baldwin like held on to their lead, held on to victory, because in the last like 45 seconds, it looked like West Nassau could come back and win the game. They were on the goal line. It was that close. Chrissy graduated from West Nassau. Chuck, I brought you up this morning that you almost got into a brawl. Was that true? Yeah, with the, with the Baldwin people because you were cheering for West Nassau on Baldwin's side. He's not usually scared. No, he didn't. I'm joking, y'all. It didn't really happen. Now, he did cheer for West Nassau, and the reason why he was was because our nephew, Nolan, Jason and Casey's son, plays for West Nassau. Um, Now, he didn't get to play the other night, but I told him, I said, Nolan, if you'd have been out there, I'd have cheered for you, only you, but I was cheering for Baldwin's football team. But I insisted because, you know, they all came, and uh, I said, look, you're in Baldwin. You've got to sit on Baldwin's side. You can't sit on the West Nassau side, the visitor side. I'm not going over there. I'm a Baldwinite. I've been here for 21 years. I'm cheering for Baldwin, right? So thankfully, Baldwin won. But I'm going to tell you this. The greatest part of that whole evening was the crisp, cool air. Isn't that a glorious thing, Rhonda? 
crisp, cool air. Now, can I ask you all a question? Because uh, this happened, an interaction happened with David um, and Rhonda this morning. They almost got into a fight as well. Uh, there's been a lot of fighting going on in my lives here lately, but um, no. No respect. <laughs> Yeah, what was it you said earlier? You said, no, you talk about an 80-year-old woman. I said, Rhonda, you're not even close. You're play, playing the drums. Oh, that's what you were talking about, playing the drums. How many of y'all think Rhonda ought to play the drums next week? Raise your hand. Everybody raise your hands. Yes. It's confirmed. What well, church voted, and uh, 1030 church voted, and uh, we're ready. Um, no, David said these words. He said, hey, Chris, can you turn the air conditioning up? No. He said up. So let me ask you this, because you know where I'm going. How many of y'all, if I asked you to turn the air conditioning up, what does that mean? How many think it's going to be to make it warmer? Raise your hands. How many think it's to make it colder? Raise your hand. Okay, we got a couple uh, (laughs) shine students. Thanks a lot, guys. But, you know, that's a a never-ending question, you know, is it, you know, if you turn the air conditioning up, that for some, that may mean turn it up like crank the air, I am hot, and I need it colder. For me, I interpret that as if you'll turn the air conditioning down. When I hear, will you turn the air conditioning up, that's music to my ears at our house. Because I don't want it at like 70 degrees. I want it at like 74, 75 degrees. How many with me on that? All right. How many like it colder? You like it like 68, you like it the, like the Antarctic, right? It's like uh, freezing, cold, Alaska. Yeah. I'm sort of a middle-of-the-road guy, y'all, but the thing about it is it's just a matter of perspective. So I, I think to myself, uh, for some, they don't like that change of it going into cooler weather. I sort of do because I'm tired of the humidity. I'm not tired of wearing shorts, I don't ever wear flip-flops because my feet are so ugly. It's not a good thing, and I spare everybody that ugliness, but not really that bad. I'm just, you know, I don't like feet, my feet. Anyway, uh, can I just tell you, this is the day that the Lord has made, but this is also the day that I've given a lot of irrelevant things. This morning service, I was like, said, that's irrelevant to the point. Let's get on with it. Here's the thing. The change that God is doing, we ought to welcome it as a new season. Now, some of y'all, fall is like one of your favorite times of year. I know it is with Chrissy, right? I, what did I say? I had an idea. Was that last Sunday? I said I had an idea for a new t-shirt for you to come up with. It's fall, y'all. And you said you already had that, right? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Chrissy, Chrissy got on my bad side after the first service. I won't tell you what happened. Just go back and look at it. I don't know, but... But what's that? <laughs> yeah, she's, she's never in the know. Um, but here's the thing. It's, it, it, fall is really one of Chrissy's favorite times of year. I wish there would be more leaves fall change. Now, we get a little bit of that. But I remember when I was growing up, one of the things that I loved to do, because there were leaves everywhere, loved to bring, you know, you were anticipate, bring them into a pile and just jump into the leaves, right? And most of the time, I'd jump up on the fire escape from the church. Don't if you're, you know, at a church and you're a pastor's kid, don't do that. But uh, we'd do that and jump in. We the biggest thing of leaves. There is nothing better, right? Now, there's nothing worse than having to rake up those leaves, because as a kid, that was like the worst job in the world. But he, it's that crisp, cool air. I think to myself, we ought to look forward to that wonderful new season when God calls us to something new and just simply follow. And that's what these guys did, their mission. Um, If you would, let's stand together as we read these verses, verse number 1 through 13, Acts chapter 13. Uh, This is really what uh, we'll term as the beginning of... um, Paul and Barnabas and Paul's first missionary journey and how that came about. The Bible says in verse number 1 of Acts 13, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, 
Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and where they came and sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistants, and this is John Mark. Um, and there's a story there that you'll probably hear in, in the weeks to come. And it says, now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who's also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and shall, blind, uh, and shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around uh, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed. When he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. But when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, or John Mark, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Lord, we love you. I pray, thanking you for your word, and thank you for even how it speaks to us right now, and how we, as your children, can come and know the, the mission that you've called us to. Lord, we love you. I just ask you to just move and work in this place, that souls will be saved and lives will be changed, that we'll walk out of here different than when we came in. And we'll pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The heartbeat of the mission. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, that you may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul's goal in his life, I don't want to run in vain, I don't want to have to have labored in vain. The only way that's going to happen with Paul, the only way it's going to happen with us is if we labor and we do for ourselves. Because we've not been called to labor to benefit us. We've been called to labor and to do His will to His good pleasure. Did you notice that first part of that verse right there in Acts chapter, or, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13? For it is God who works, listen, in who? In you. God's working. He's called you. He's called you to a mission. He's called you for a reason. For His good pleasure. And to, for His will. Both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Now, that ought to change everything. You talk about the heartbeat of our mission, that ought to change everything. How we do what we do and the fact that we do it and the attitude with which we do it. How many of y'all have ever had a really uh, just a crummy attitude? How many of y'all had a bad attitude this morning before you got to church? Anybody? Want a minute? I don't, but there are. Let me ask you this. How many of y'all have ever had a bad attitude before you came to church? Ever? Has that ever happened? Right? What's that? Yeah. How many of y'all have kids? That's the cause of it. Root cause. Now, what does it say? Do all things without complaining and disputing. Quit complaining. Quit arguing. Some people just like to argue and complain, right? Some people are just not satisfied with peace. 
It's like, hey, we got too much peace going around here. And again, let's go back to with teenagers, it's sometimes like that. No offense, teenagers. I'm having fun, y'all. Don't take it personally. Don't now think about it for a moment. Do we do what we do with cheerfulness and joyfulness? Yeah, that's going to depend. And we're going to get into this in a moment, the heartbeat of our mission and why we do what we do and what it is that we're about as his church. We don't want to lose sight of that. Last few months has caused a lot of people to lose sight of that. He's called us for a reason. What? That you may become blameless and harmless children of God. What are we saying? We're saying, I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Try that. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. By the way, this group is exciting in here. I love it. The other groups, you know, the nine o'clock, if you're watching and you're nine o'clock, you all did great as well. But it's hard waking those people up. <laughs> Part of it's waking this guy up, and I'm the one that's preaching. It's like, I, I, one thing I can never say, I've never fallen asleep while I'm preaching, actually. That's good news. If I ever do, will you wake me up, honey? Um, yeah, okay. After I've just told her she was irrelevant, I don't know if she will or not. Not even sure I'm going to get dinner today, so she's looking at me with that look. Move along. Children of God without fault in the midst. Now, listen, we got to find this trick out because we find ourselves complaining about the way things are in our generation, but what do we expect? That's where we are. We live in a world of darkness. Our job is to live as blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of what? Not in the midst of perfect circumstances, but in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Can it be done is the question. Well, sure it can. We're children of God. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. This is our calling. And I'm, I'm setting the stage for what's to come in Acts chapter 13. Our calling. Shine as lights in this world, holding fast the word of life. Again, you have a calling, the heartbeat of the mission. And as we re realize this calling, there's a few things that we need to see today. First, I want you to see that we're the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. You ever had somebody said these words before? Those people down at that church. But when you're talking to them, you realize that they're supposed to be part of that church. You say, wait a second, that's us, right? You people at that church. Well, aren't, aren't you part of it? Well, yeah, but you've, it's us. It's not them, but it's us. Do you count it a privilege to be a part of the body of Christ? Are there benefits to the body of Christ? Is it a joy to be a part of the body of Christ? For some people, you think, okay, the body of Christ, but it's a nuisance to me. It's an aggravation to me, and I just don't know, uh, you know. I love the Lord, but I just really can't stand them people down at that First Baptist Church of Baldwin. We're the body of Christ. Call that ones. Now, let me speak about these five guys right here. Barnabas. Who's Barnabas anyway, right? You know him. Son of encouragement. In Acts chapter 11, verse 24, it says that Barnabas is a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and, or Holy Spirit and of faith. In verse 24 of Acts chapter 11, this guy was an encourager. He had a big heart. You know somebody like that? They just encourage you. When they walk in, they just encourage you. I'm not going to talk about that person that walks in the room and just discourages you. We'll, we'll just take away from that for a moment. Acts chapter 4, the Bible tells us that Barnabas is the one who sold all that he had and he gave to those in need. In Acts chapter 9, the Bible tells us that he was the one who came alongside Saul who would become Paul when he was saved on that Damascus road. And he came and he befriended him and he testified to Paul's conversion. 
He came alongside him. That's Barnabas. And by the way, let me back up. The church at Antioch. Remember what we talked about last week? The, the Christians were first called, they were, the disciples were first called Christians where? In Antioch. They had a testimony in a crooked and perverse generation. They had a testimony in a city of sexual immorality. They had a testimony in a city that had followed, tried to follow false gods. But yet through all of that, they had a testimony those disciples were called Christians, Christ followers first in Antioch. So there's some things going on in this church. Simeon, nicknamed Niger, which is uh, uh, probably from Africa, and some speculate this could have been Simon of Cyrene who carried the cross for Christ. Don't know that for sure, but some speculate with that. Be that as is May uh, Lucius from North Africa, modern Libya and a Gentile possibly could have been one of the men to bring the gospel to Antioch. Manian, his name, and this is the one I want to focus on for a moment, his name actually means comforter or consoler and found out that he had been brought up with Herod. Huh. Now, can you imagine this? He'd grown up in the home of Herod the Great, the man who murdered John the Baptist. You ever had that statement before, if those walls could speak, right? Can you imagine growing up in, in that household? But here we find a disciple who had been just that. And then, of course, who's the last guy they mention? And they just actually, it's sort of funny, a primary figure in the chapters to come, someone who was instrumental, the Holy Spirit used to uh, write a good portion of the New Testament, and we find two words here, and Saul. All these guys, and Saul. And these were the guys that were there. The former persecutor of Christians. It was Paul the Apostle. Now, it's important for us to understand, very different men. But here's the key. They all had the hand of God on them. We're different, aren't we? Different. You're different probably from the person next to you. Have you ever said these words before? I just don't feel like a matter. Don't feel like I have a place. They'll never notice if I'm there or not. I'm not as qualified as so-and-so. I can't do what they do. We reason it out and we listen to the lie that says we have no, we can't, we're just, we're meaningless. And now we'll say this to you. God's called you more than just sit in a chair. He's called all of us. Right? What do I say? We are the body of Christ. He has placed you in the body of Christ. And I'm going to just, in the context of where we are this morning, let me just say this to you. We're speaking, let's talk about the local church for a moment. God's placed you in the local church right here at First Baptist Church of Baldwin for a reason. It's not by chance you're here. He said, well, this is speaking of just the overall body of Christ. No, I, I believe, you see in the book of Acts, these local churches local bodies of believers established for a reason for the furtherance of the gospel. At Antioch, they had a sweet fellowship. They had a church that was there just as sweet as this. And you think about the, the job that God has for us to do. But he's placed you here for a reason. And I want to just make this a personal commitment to you as your pastor. Because one of the things that are uh, hard for me sometimes to look past in my life, because we all live busy lives, right? And it's hard to look past yourself to see what's going on in somebody's life and say, hey, let me come alongside you and help you find your way. As pastor, that's my calling. To give you the word, but also show you the way. 
And I think it's important for you to understand that because you may be to that place. I just don't know what my place is in the body of Christ. How about this? I don't know either, but come to me and let's pray together. Make you a commitment to pray. Because these things are revealed. These, these things you can't just say, okay, let's dream up some stuff for you to do. Because that's not where it starts. Actually knowing your place in the body of Christ first, and then he'll show you his purpose. He'll reveal to you just what it is that he's called you to. See, we can find ourselves complaining, as I just, you know, for a number of reasons. Number one, somebody might be complaining in their service of the Lord, saying, let somebody else do it. I'm tired. Or, why does everybody else have to always hog the spot? I want to be able to do something around here. It's okay. Because I'm going to give you a passage of Scripture over in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 11 through 16, and it simply says this. And he, gave, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, measure the stature of fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth to the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, he himself gave to the church the different members, different functions. Why? It says here, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body. Equipping. That's part of what it is to be a part of the body of Christ, being equipped. Every time we gather in here, in church, it in a sense, it's equipping. Every time you're part of a small group, that's equipping. Every time that you are serving in, an, in a capacity, that's God equipping you and fulfilling that calling in your life but not just equipping the saints, but also equipping for what? For the work of ministry. See, the end of that equipping isn't for you to go home full and say, okay, I'm good. You ever eat a meal? I, I, this goes sound Again, talk about food. That was me yesterday. You ever eaten a meal that's just sat heavy on you? You know what I'm saying when I say, it's like, it's just like there, like Thanksgiving's coming up, by the way, y'all couple months, but it's coming up. Start getting your menu now. We're coming over. <laughs> Turkey dressing all the trimmings, right? You ever had that meal where you just ate and it just all, it just like up to your throat, it just sat heavy on you and it's like, I got to go do something. Thanksgiving that way. You know, when you get done with Thanksgiving meal, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because, you know, we got a couple months yet, but you're miserable because you ate so much and you don't, can't figure out whether you should lie down or go for a walk. You go for a walk, you can be miserable. You lie down, you're miserable, right? Let's think about this for a moment. When you're equipped, when God pours into you, He doesn't do it so you can just let it sit because all that does is spoil and sour. He equips you for the work of ministry. What is that? Again, let's pray together about that. Because he has placed you in the body of Christ for a reason. Why? Do we come to unity of faith? By the way, the edifying of the body of Christ, the building up. You know what's great? For us to be together, we're, we're, we're to be building each other up, not tearing each other down. Churches, sometimes you see people, they get selfish, prideful jealous. And they'll do what they can to try to tear somebody else down. But our job, as we're equipping for the work of ministry, we're to be building up the body of Christ and the work that Jesus is doing. Because by the way, that is what's really at stake. It's the work that Jesus is doing through his church. 
It's not the work that you're doing. It's the work that God is pouring through you. Now, why? Here's the end. To we come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ. Boy, you talk about fullness of Christ. You talk about what he does, the overflow. And I said something this morning at our early morning worship, and I think this is so true. And this, is, this came from our Bible study, the all-in Bible study from this past Friday with Chrissy and I. That our worship doesn't come from the external, whatever it is, songs, whatever you see, all of that. It doesn't come. Our worship comes from God filling us to overflowing where it, we can do nothing but just return with gratefulness and thankfulness and worship. Fullness of Christ. I think why sometimes we don't worship as much as we do is we're not full. We're full of the world, we're full of everything else, but we're not full of Christ. I'm going to tell you this, you get full of Him and you'll be full of joy. You get full of Him and you'll be full of worship. You, you just can't help yourself. But again, what? You, know, you look at the fullness of Christ and all of those things, and it says that we should be no longer be children tossed to and fro. Remember, we're the body of Christ, we're children of God, but we're not to be children of God tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, the cunning and craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love. And that's our function as the church, is as we're teaching and as we're edifying and all those things. That speaking of the truth in love, it's important that truth is the key, the authority of the Word of God. Teaching the Word of God, that's what's going to bring unity. That's what's going to bring excitement. That's what's going to bring encouragement is when we bear the truth of the Word of God. And by the way, false doctrine only brings confusion and division. And so there was a church different, but they had the same function. Now, let me say this one point before we move on. I got 11 minutes if we hold to the hour template. Church at Antioch. I already mentioned about Antioch, what that was. The church, ecclesia. Give me a definition, a called out assembly. You know what that means? Two things. Called out and assembly. That lets me know that both are important. Let's take the assembly first, the assembling of the brethren. It's important to assemble. But if we have assembling without going and carrying out our commission, then we've just assembled. But if we carry out the commission on our own and say, I don't need it, all those people down there. I don't need the church. I'm just going to do my own thing. That's just as incomplete. So you need both. Why do we assemble? We prepare for the work that God has called us to out there. We serve in here. We serve in the church. We do what we can inside the church. But that's not, it has to be, it's not an either or. It is a both and. Does that make sense? Somebody said, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be a part of the church. Yes, you do. It's essential in your walk. It's essential in your encouragement. It's essential because you are part of the body of Christ. You're not alone. And that's a good thing. We're to bear each other's burdens. We're to to laugh with each other and share joy with each other. We're to grieve with one another when the time to grieve. We go through mountaintops and valleys together. And it is a great thing to be a part of the family of God. Right? Isn't it great to be a part of the family of God? Now it's been sort of different. Two services. One day soon. I don't know when it's going to be. I've got an idea in my mind. I want you to pray about things, how things go. Maybe one day soon we'll be able to put both of these services together. We'll be able to worship as one body again. I don't know when that, well, I do know when that, I'm praying. Let me just say this. Would y'all pray with me on something? I'm praying. Don't. I'm just saying you all pray right now. If you're online and you didn't get this in the early morning service, I'm really praying about a December time frame for us to be able to do that. Don't know 
We'll just have to watch and see because, it, you know, there's some concerns still. Once we put it to get back together, I'm going to tell you this, it's going to be hard to tear apart, right? Because some of you are here at 1030 and you're missing some of those people that you've seen at the nine o'clock service. You know what I'm saying? I'm just praying. I'm not saying we're doing that yet. Okay. Don't take, put words in my mouth. I'm just praying about it. Would you pray with me? Again, probably getting something ahead of myself, but all I know is this. We can't stay like this. Well, I mean, I guess we could, but I just feel like God wants us to. There's some things for us to do. I, I know a lot of people have been asking about Sunday school. It's important. Sunday school is important. Ed, the edification of the church, the encouraging of the, the body of believers as we proclaim the church. I'm looking forward to that mo- day that we can get back to that. And by the way, in October, we're going to be introducing some different small groups, and we'll be letting you know about that as well. Called out assembly. You're part of the church if you're saved, if you're a child of God. Because if you're a child of God, you're part of the family of God. We are the body of Christ. Now, number two, the heartbeat of the mission, we have to realize first we're the body, part of the body of Christ. Number two, we have to realize that we've been called to serve. You know what makes for... Let me use that term again. You know what makes for a cranky old man? I'm not looking at any of you, by the way. Someone who does nothing but serve themselves. You know what gets sweeter in our lives is when we make it about serving the Lord and serving others. If you're living for self, you're going to be one miserable Christian. If you're a believer... We've been called to go beyond. What did the Bible say here? The Bible said in verse number two, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. They ministered to the Lord and they fasted. Now, that word minister to the Lord, that phrase minister to the Lord, literally means that they served publicly. We've been called to serve. Now, that second part, they fasted. What does that mean? They were praying. They were seeking the Lord about some things. Um, and it's important for us to understand as Baptists, we don't know much about fasting. And I said earlier, you know, when our idea of fast is let's fast, but let's do it really fast. <laughs> How many of y'all have been like that? Okay, you know, I'm going to fast, but it's going to be between breakfast and lunch. Between lunch and dinner, that's too long of a period of time. Breakfast and lunch, boy, that'd be great. Why do people fast? And that's a biblical thing, fasting and praying. And by the way, it says if you are fasting, by the way, don't put a miserable countenance on your face saying, oh, look look at me, I'm suffering for the Lord, I'm fasting. I mean, you're talking to a guy who's constantly hungry anyway. That's why I talk about food so much. I just enjoy it, y'all. I just enjoy the experience. Don't judge me. It's about fellowship. It's not about the food. It's about the food. But let's talk about service for a moment. We've been called to serve. Now, I'll give you a cross-reference here. Uh, Book of Galatians, chapter 6, in verse number 9 says this, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. You know, um, we're all going to grow weary in doing good. But what this means, what this is saying, don't grow weary while doing good. In other words, I'm sick and tired of serving those people. I'm sick and tired of doing that job. I'm sick and tired of fulfilling that calling. Can't somebody else do it? Again, what do we begin with? Do all things without uh, without complaining and disputing. It ought to be a joy for you to serve. Now, have at any point in time in the over 30 years of ministry I've been involved in, have I ever seen anybody that really didn't enjoy their service? Sure. Have I ever seen anybody complain about their service? Oh, you bet. Have you ever complained about your service? Hopefully not, but if you have, get over it. 
even realize you've been called to serve. And that's the best place to be. I think I may have shared with, you, with Chrissy and I, um, I don't think I ever want to retire. I pray that until we take our last breath that we make our life about serving others, serving God, and then through Him, serving others. When I'm 95 years old, if I make it that long, I want to still be serving somebody. You think, well, what a miserable time. Can't you just take a little bit of time for yourself and <laughs> use that phrase again, go in the RV and travel across country? I might go in an RV and travel across country one day, but I'm still going to be serving people because I know that's the secret to my joy and your joy as well. Don't be weary. Don't be sick of it. You ever get sick of something before? Like, for instance, I know you never said, I'm so sick of these trains around here. I know you've never said that. You ever been sick and tired of something? One thing we're not to be sick and tired of, and that's serving the Lord. You see, at a place, they were serving in and through the church. And by the way, let me just say this. As you serve, you're not supposed to be serving just by yourself. Because some people get it in the idea they know better than what everybody else at that church knows. I can do it better. I know better. I don't need those people. And so you do it on your own. You know what that is? Satan will make, convince you thinking that you can do it on your own. But he's, God has always intended, as Christ is the head of the church, for us to serve in and through his church doesn't mean that we just serve here. It means that as we're serving, we're serving as a part of the body of Christ. And by the way, as we're serving Him, the presence of Jesus goes with us. The preaching of the Word is our priority. And the power of the Holy Spirit is what enables us and empowers us to do what we do. Let me challenge you. If you're sitting around right now, wonder why God's not expanding your influence and giving you a ministry and wondering why in the world it is that you don't have more, maybe it's because you haven't been faithful where you are. Now think about that for a moment. That Again, that's a, one of those things, that, ouch, right? You know how we live our lives and our service is this. We say this, God, somewhere down the road you have a place for service. Show me. But we're not willing to serve where he has us right here and right now. So here's a good principle. Do what he's already revealed to you. The problem is we just do what we want to do anyway. We soak up into ourselves. I'm going to tell you again, let me just say this. If you're soaking in yourself, no wonder you're miserable. If you're soaking in yourself and not being willing, not being available, no wonder God's not showing you new things. It's not him, it's you. And that sounds harsh. I'm not pointing the finger because that's me too sometimes when I get full of myself and get full of my own ways and what I want to do. Now, I used a phrase this morning, too, too, many peop, too many of God's people are idle while the world is going to hell. It's not somebody else's job. It's yours. It's my job. So let's go change the world for him. We're the body of Christ. We've been called to serve. These guys, they were ministering to the Lord and they were fasting. And check this out. The third thing, as we're being called to serve, as we're part of the body of Christ, number three, we are to go to all the world. And again, I said something earlier. This is the beginnings of the, you know, Paul's first missionary journey. We're going to see some exciting things happen. But after they fasted and after they prayed, after they sought the Lord, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit spoke. And that's the way it works. Spend time with him. Get in his word. Let the Holy Spirit seek him. The Holy Spirit's going to speak. He's going to reveal to you. He's going to let you know. And what did the Holy Spirit say? Separate Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them. After they fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on him and they sent him away. No fanfare. They laid their hands on them and they sent them out. Now, you know, we talk about with ministerial and deacons and all of that, with laying on the hands and all of that. But I'm going to tell you this. In a sense, isn't that what we do every time that we leave this place? When we have our final prayer this morning, in a sense, let's just look at it this way. 
We have laid our hands on you in prayer. Now go and carry on the calling that God has given you. You walk out the back doors of the church, it ought to change how you view things. It's not, I'm leaving God here at the church. So glad God's at that 97 South Center Street, but that's where he stays. No. He's taking you out to a world to go change it for the gospel of Christ because there's hope. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's hope. They were available. That's all we have to be. Don't have to be qualified. Don't, he'll do all that work. You make yourself available. They were prepared, by the way. They were listening to the right thing. They were listening to God. They listened to the voice of God. How many of us were listening to all the other voices of this world and were wondering why can't God speak Because we drowned out Him with all the noise of, of the world? They knew that they had a place to go. Now, I will say this, uh, and I'm going to close with this. The book of Isaiah chapter 6 tells us after Isaiah had seen a holy God, and that's the way it happens, right? And you've seen this illustration or this outline. You know, you get that upward look, right? And then you get the inward look. You see God in His holiness, and then all it does is cause you to see your sinfulness because we're sinners. The Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of, glory of God. The wages of sin is death, right? And that's where Isaiah was in Isaiah chapter 6. And by the way, uh, as I mentioned this morning, Monday school, make sure you tune in tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Ernie and Carol doing a great job. Last week they did Isaiah 6. It was a fantastic study. Go back and look at that. But Isaiah, in response to a holy God, says what? Woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. We take so lightly just being in the presence of God. We take it for granted. We realize somebody died for you that we could enter in his presence, and his name is Jesus. And by the way, here's what happened. After the uh, change, and, and the Bible says, uh, you know, that the seraphim flew, having a, uh, in his hands a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs of the altar, and he touched my mouth with it. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. After that salvation, after that sin being taken away, freeing from the burden and the shackles of sin, the Bible says this is our natural response. In verse number 8, I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Now, it might be easy for me. Hear my Lord, but send Chuck, please. I'm weary and well doing. I don't want to do that anymore. Send Chuck. Here am I. Send that old Jason Dempsey guy. He has better magic tricks than me anyway. Yeah, that's an inside joke. We've, but. And he knows a lot more foreign languages than I do. Here am I. Send it Eric Martin. He can sing a lot better than I can. Right? Now, is what we do, though, isn't it? Hey, how many of y'all are quick to volunteer somebody else? Not even. You learned your lesson, huh? Hey, you hear of a need, and what do we do? We'll volunteer. How many of y'all have ever done this before? You hear of a need? Uh, you say, well, my pastor, my deacon, my Sunday school teacher could take care of that need. And maybe God's calling you to take care of that need. Here am I. Send me. You can't do it if you're not willing. Can't do it if you're making excuses. Can't do it if you're, you get the idea. That's our calling. That's our hope. Now, uh, as we can see, uh, and I'm not going to have a chance, as I didn't this morning either, uh, to go through all the details of what took place uh, in this uh, through verse number 13, but suffice it to say, had a situation of a man who was searching uh, the pro council, uh, Sergius Paulus, and the Bible said he was searching, he sought, uh, called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. And of course, the sorcerer tried to get in the way and said, Hey, you don't need to listen to them. And he was trying to do what he can to steer him away from hearing the word of God. And boy, help that person, right? That tries to get in the way and ruin the hearing of the word of God. 
And of course, through a series of things, the Bible gives the, gives the testimony that, um, uh, that he believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Can I just say this to you? Um, there is not a mold when we minister for the Lord, when we serve the Lord, and when we answer his call to go to the world. There's not a mold that says, if you do these things, it's going to fit in this mold, and it's never going to be messy, and it's always going to be a perfect situation, and you're always going to be fulfilled. Is that the way ministry looks? Because all I know is this. Most of the time, ministry, if you do it right, and I've said this before, is really messy because you're dealing with broken lives and you have to take a risk and you have to take a chance on people. And sometimes they aren't where you think they ought to be. That's why we have to pray for God to do that work in their lives. You know, it's an amazing, <laughs> it's an amazing thing. It's amazing to me that when God begins to do a work in somebody's life, we're so quick to give up on them if they don't toe the line or do what they're supposed to do. But you have to realize they're not at the same position you're at. It, let me put it to you this way. We want God's grace for us, but we're not willing to give grace to somebody else. Sometimes fall flat on their face and for him to pick them up. Sometimes we get the mistaken impression that we do everything perfect, but we had to grow just like somebody else did. You know, does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? That's, a, you know, that's sort of a freebie there, but it's important for us to understand ministry when you do it, when you serve the Lord, it's not going to be easy sometimes. But are you willing to say, here am I, send me anyway? Are you willing to say, God, I'm the one, use me. And when you do, guess what? Right around the corner, there's going to be heartbreak. Right around the corner, there's going to be probably miserable failure sometimes. Right around the corner, there's going to be people that will not appreciate what you do and what you stand for. Serve him anyway. Go anyway. Be available anyway. Because it doesn't make a difference circumstantially what happens when you're obedient. The key is obedience that brings joy. And when you do that, by the way, who's the rewarder of all these things? We don't work for Hey, I appreciate you. You do, you do such a great job. You're so talented. This is what we work for. Well done, a good and faithful servant. Would you stand with me for prayer? We're body of Christ. We've been called to serve. We're to go to all the world. It's not going to be perfect. In fact, like I said, it's going to be messy. And it's going to be, but here's where it begins. You all ready for this? Can't have any of that if you don't have a relationship with Christ. And I'm speaking to somebody this morning, you know, maybe in this place, maybe online, you know that when I speak about a person not being saved or a person being unsaved, still in their trespasses and sins, you know that's instinctively right now God's spirit is speaking to you through the word of God and saying I'm lost that's me I don't have to convince you of that I don't have to beg you you already know that you're lost and that you need Jesus I'm going to pray a prayer I'm going to invite you to pray with me if you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior and again I can't convince you that you already know that you're lost you already know that things aren't right between you and God and it's heavy on you right now, but there's nothing more freeing than giving your life to him and being saved. I've made you wait long enough. Let's pray. And if you're not saved, would you pray with me right now? Dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner. And I know that I'm broken and separated from you. And as hard as it is for me, Lord, to face that, I know I have to because I need you to forgive me and set things right between you and me. Release this burden of sin. So, Father, today is my response. I turn from my sin 
and I call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to save me right here and right now. I turn from my sin, Lord, and I recognize that Jesus died for me and paid the price for my sin and rose again. And today I believe that in my heart and confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And ask you, Lord, please save me. I will live for you by faith. And each and every day, Lord, I depend upon you, not just for my salvation, but for you to provide each and every step of the way so I might serve you until Jesus comes again. Thank you for saving me, Lord. I'll live for you. If you prayed that prayer, my prayer is that you'll know the importance of responding Believer's baptism is your first step of obedience. But growing in the Word and growing in the Lord and finding a place to serve, those are the next steps as well. We want to show you those next steps. If you pray and receive Christ, if you're here in the sanctuary, of course, when we begin to sing in just a second, He touched me, maybe, just maybe, you need to be that person to step out of the aisle and come and say, Hey, Pastor, hey, Chris, I just give my life to the Lord. I've just been saved. Hey, there's a glorious thing. It takes guts to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but maybe you need to come and say, look, this is, this is my proclamation. I've just been saved, and I want to follow through in believer's baptism, and I want to follow Jesus the rest of my life. We'll show you baptism. We'll show you how to grow in the Lord, point you to the Word, but most importantly, I'm going to let you know you're not alone, that you've been brought into the family of God. If you're online right now, a couple of ways that you can let us know so we can come alongside you. Uh, you can call the church office right now. Somebody's in the back ready to receive your phone call, 904-266-4222. The number's on the screen there. You can go to fbcball1.com and click the uh, My Decision tab and click that decision, which is uh, the most appropriate. Maybe you've been saved. Maybe you've rededicated your life. Maybe you need to follow through and believe for baptism. Whatever it is that you, you need to let us know so we can come alongside you, please let us know right now. Or maybe in the comment section below, say, I've just given my life to the Lord. I've just been saved. We'll rejoice with you. All of heaven is rejoicing. We're going to rejoice with you. But I'm so thankful that you're not alone, that you've been brought into the family of God. So the decision now is yours. Be obedient to his call. Lord, we love you. Thank you for speaking to us your word and giving us our testimony. He touched me and made me whole. Thank you, Lord, for being an awesome God worthy of praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your decision right now. Let's make this our proclamation. Shackled. Shackled by a heavy burden. Neath the load of guilt and shame. Trust him right now. Anybody in here, you need to come to the altar right now. You need to come make your public commitment to the Lord. Would you do that right now? Don't hesitate. Don't hold back. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. Well, you just let go and let God take the lead today. He is so good. He is so worthy. He is so able. Something. I met since I met this blood. Do you know Jesus this morning? Do you know him? Praise him. Since he cleansed and made me whole. Come on, church, let's praise him. I will never cease to praise him.
Let's go change the world, right, man, church?